Chapter 3 When I had attained the age of seventeen, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, and but my father thought it was necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before that date resolved that the, the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever. Her illness was severe, and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She at first yielded to our entreaties, but when she heard that the life of her favorite was menaced, she could no longer control her anxiety. She attended her sick bed. Her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved, but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver. On the third day my mother sickened, for her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms, and the looks of her medical attendants prog the prognosticated the worst events. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of the this best women would did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes, the future happiness were placed upon the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to my younger children. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you, and happy and beloved as I have been. It is not hard to quit you all, but these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil and the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she, whom we saw every day, and whose very existence appeared a part of our own, can how and have been be departed forever, that the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished, and the sound of a voice so familiar and so dear to the ear can be hushed never more to be heard there are the reflections of the first days but when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil then the actual bitterness of brief grief commences yet from whom i would has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection and why should i describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel. The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessary, and the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead, and we still had duties which we ought to perform, and we must continue our course with the rest, and learn not to think ourselves for and learn to think ourselves fortunate whilst one remains whose spoiler has not been seized. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred to by those events, were now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks. I appeared to be me sacrilege to leave so soon in response, and to leave the repose, akin to death, of the house of mourning, and to rush into the thick of life. I was new to sorrow, but it did not uh, the less alarm me. I was unwilling to quit the sight of those who remained to me, and above all, I desired to see my sweet Elizabeth in some degree consoled. She indeed veiled her grief, and strove to act the comforter to us all. She looked steadily on life, 
and assumed its duties and with courage and zeal. She devoted herself to those whom she, sh she had been taught to call her uncles and cousins. Never was she so enchanting at this time, as at this time, when she recalled the sunshine of her smiles and spent them upon us. She forgot even her own regret in her endeavors to make us forget. The day of my departure at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavored to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me and to become my fellow student, but in vain. His father was a narrow-minded traitor and saw idleness and ruin in the aspirations and ambitions of his son. Henry deeply felt the misfortune of being debarred from liberal education. He said little, but when he spoke, I read in his kindling eye and his animating glance a restrained but firm resolve not to be chained to the miserable details of commerce. We sat late. We could not tear ourselves away from each other, nor persuade ourselves to say the word farewell. It was said, and we retired on the pretense of seeking repose, each fancying that the other was deceived. But when at morning's dawn I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, they were all there. My father again to bless me, Clerval to press my hand once more, my Elizabeth to renew her entreaties that I would write often, and to bestow the last feminine attentions on her playmate and friend. I threw myself into the, ch into the chase that was to convey me away, and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in the endeavouring to bestow mutual pleasure. I was now alone. In the university, whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had been given me invincible repugnance to new continences. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey, but as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and I had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with, and it would, indeed, have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingloslot, which was long and fatiguing. At length, the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted, and was conducted to my solitary apartment, to spend the evening as I please. The next morning, I delivered my letters of introduction, and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. Chance, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction, which asserted omnipotent sway over me from the moment I turned my reluctant steps up from my father's door, had led me first to M. Crimp, professor of natural philosophy. He was an uncouth man, but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. He asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied carelessly, and partly in contempt, mentioned the names of my alchemists as principal authors I had studied. The professor stayed, stared. Have you, said he, um, really spent your time studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute. Every minute, continued M. Cramp, with warmth, every instant that you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names, good God. One in desert land have you lived, where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies, which you have so greedily imbibed, 
are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient. I, have, I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Periclesis. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So saying, he swept aside and wrote down a list of several books treating the nat treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he didn't commence a course of lectures upon a natural philosophy in its general relations, and then M. Waldman, a fellow professor, would but lecture upon chemistry on the alternate days that he omitted. I returned home, not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered those authors useless, whom the professor reprobated, but I returned not at all the more inclined to recur to those these studies in any shape. M. Cripp was a little squat man, who, with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance, the teacher, therefore, did not possess uh, my favours of his pursuits. In, in rather too philosophical and connected a strain, perhaps, I have given an account of the conclusions I come to concerning them in my early years. As a child, I had not been content with the results promised by modern professors of natural science. With a conclusion of idea root is only to be accounted for by my extreme youth and my want of a guide on such matters. I had retrod the steps of knowledge along the path of time and exchanged discoveries of recent inquirers for the dreams of forgotten alchemists. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the matters of masters of science sought immortality and power. Such views, though futile, were grand, but now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of, of those visions on which my interest in science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange the cinemas of sorry, exchange the chimeras of boundless grandeur for the realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days of my residence in Ingolstadt, which which were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents of my new abode. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which M. Kremp had given me concerning the lectures, and although I could not consult to go and hear what that little conceited fellow delivers since and since out of a pulpit, I recollected that he what he had said of M. Waldman, whom I had never seen, and he had hither, as hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went to the lecturing room, where M. Waldman entered shortly after. The professor was very much unlike his colleague. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an assert, uh, aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few grey hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short, but remarkably erect, and his voice was the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a replication of the history of chemistry, and the various improvements made by the different men of learning, pronouncing with fervour the names of the most distinguished discoveries. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science, and exclaimed in many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of science, of this science, said he, promised the impossibilities, and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted, and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But there was these philosophers, whose hands seemed only made to dabble in the dirt, and their eyes to pore over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. 
They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascended to the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say such words of fate, announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if with my soul were grappling with a parabolic enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched, in which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord, a sound was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much more had been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein, far, far more. I will achieve. Treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world my, the deepest mysteries of creation. I closed not my eyes that night. My internal was being was in a state of insurrection and turmoil. I felt that order would threats arise, but I had no power to produce it. By degrees, after the morning dawn, sleep came, I woke, and my yesternight's thoughts were as a dream. There only remained a resolution to return to my ancient studies, and to devote myself to a science for which I believe myself to possess a natural talent. On the same day, I paid a mauled a visit. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public. For there he was a certain dignity in his mane during his lecture, which, in his own house, was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. I gave him pretty... I gave him pretty nearly the same amount of time of my few former pursuits as I had given to his fellow professor. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of Corpelius Acreba, Agrippa, Agrippa, and Pericleses, but without the contempt that M. Kremp had exhibited. He said that these were men, were men that were to be whose indefinable zeal modern philosophers were indebted to for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had been left. They had left us as an easier task. They give us new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts which they, in a great degree, had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labors of man, men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the, to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to his statement and was delivered without any presumption or affection, affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists. I expressed myself in measured terms, with the modest, modesty and deference due from a youth to his instructor, without letting escape. An experience in life would have made me ashamed. Any of the enthusiasm which stimulated my intended labors. I requested his advice concerning the books I ought to procure. Oh, I am happy, said M. Waldman, to have gained a disciple. And if your application of equ equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is a branch of the natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been made and may be made. It is on that the account that I have made it my particular study. But... It is at the same time that I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make but a very sorry chemist if he, did, if he attended that department of human knowledge alone. If you wish to really become a man of science, and not merely a petty experimentalist, I advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me to his laboratory, 
and explained to me the uses of various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure, and promising me the use of his own, when I should need have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He gave me the list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. The day thus ended a day memorable to me, and it decided my future destiny. Chapter 4 From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, in the most comprehensive sense of terms, became nearly my sole occupation. I read with ardor those works, so full of genius and discrimination, which modern inquirers have written on these subjects. I attended the lectures, and cultivated the acquaintance of the men of the science of the university, and I even found in Mim Kremp a great deal of sound science, sound sense, and real information, combined, it is true, with the repulsive physiognomy and manners, but not on that account the less valuable. In M. Waldman I found a true friend. His gentleness was never tinged by dogmatism, and his instructions were given with an air of frankness and good nature that banished every idea of pedantry. In a thousand ways he soothed, smoothed for me the path of knowledge, and made the most abstruse inquiries clear and facile to my appreh apprehension. My application was at first fluctuant and uncertain. It gained strength as I proceeded, and soon became so ardent and eager that the stars often disappeared in the night of the morning whilst I was yet engaged in my laboratory. As I applied so closely, it may be easily conceived that my progress was rapid. My ardor was indeed the astonishment of the students, and my proficiency that of the masters. Professor Kremt often asked me, with a sly smile, how could Cornelius Agrippa went on, while M. Waldman expressed the most heartfelt exultation in my progress. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, but was engaged heart and soul in the pursuit of some discoveries, which I hoped to make. None but those who I have experienced them can conceive of the enticements of science, in other studies you go as far as others have gone before you, and there is nothing more to know. But in scientific pursuit, there is a continual food for discovery and wonder. A mind of moderate capacity, which closely pursues one study, must infallibly arrive at great proficiency in that study. And I, who continually sought the attainment of one object of pursuit, and was solely wrapped up in this, improved so rapidly that... At the end of two years, I made some discoveries in the improvement of some chemical instruments, which procured me a great esteem and admiration in the university. When I arrived at this point, and had become um, all as well acquainted with the theory and practice of natural philosophy as depended on the lessons of any of the professors at Ingolstadt, my residence there being no longer conductive to my improvements, I thought of returning to my friends at my native town, when an incident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had particularly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal imbued with, dude with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which had been considered as a mystery, Yet, with how many things there are, we were upon the brink of becoming acquainted, if cowardness or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries. I resolved these circumstances in my mind, and determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which relate to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to the study would have been irksome, almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life, we must have first have recourse to death. I, have be I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. 
In my education, my father had taken a great precaution that my mind should be impressed with no supernatural horrors. I do not ever remember having trembled at the tale of superstition, or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness had no effect upon my fancy, and an, a churchyard was to me merely a receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which, from being the seat of beauty and strength, had become food for the worms. Now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay, and forced to spend days and nights in vaults and ch um, charnel houses. My, my attention was fixed upon every object f the most insupportable to the galaxy of hu the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blossoming cheek of life. I saw how the worms inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutiae of causation, as exemplified in the change of life from life to death, and death to life, until from the midst of darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect, which it illustrated, I was surprised that among the many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover in so astonishing a secret. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not merely shine, not, does not more certainly shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle might have produced it, yet the stages to discovery were distinct and probable. After many days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. The astonishment which I first experienced in the, on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. After so much time spent in painful labor, to arrive at once at the summit of my desires, and the most gratifying consummation of my toils. But this discovery was so great and overwhelming, that all the steps by which I had pro progressively led to it were obliterated, and I beheld only the result. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. Not that, like a magic scene, it all opened upon me at once. The information which I had obtained was of, na of a nature rather to direct my endeavors so soon as I should point them towards the object of my search, than to exhibit the object already accomplished. I was like the Arabian, who had been buried with the dead, and found a passage to life, aided, by old, aided only by one glimmering and seeming ineffectual light. I see by your eagerness, and the wonder and hope in your eye, which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret which I am well acquainted, that I can't, that cannot be. Listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am reserved upon the subject. I will not lead you on, unguarded and ardent as I was then, to your destruction and infallible mystery. Misery, learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example. And how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier the man is who believes his native town be the world, that he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found when I found so astonishing a power placed within my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the matter in which I should employ it. Although I possessed the capacity of bestowing animation, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, and with all its intricacies of fibres, muscles, and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labour. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler, simpler organisation, 
but my imagination was much too exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt uh, my abilities to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. The materials at present were within my command hardly appeared adequate to so arduous an undertaking, but I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. I prepared myself for a multitude of reserves. My operations might be incessantly baffled, and at last my work be perfect. Yet, when I consider the improvement which every day makes takes place in science and mechanics, I was encouraged to hope uh, my present attempts I was encouraged to hope my present attempts would at last lay the foundations of future success. Nor could I consider the magnitude and complexity of my plan as any argument of its impracticability. It was with those feeling, these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minutes, minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary, contrary to my first intention, to make a being of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet tall in height, and proportionally large. After having formed this determination, and having spent some months in successful collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onward, like a hurricane, in the enthusiasm of success. Life and death appeared to me ideal bonds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might, in process of time, although I now found it impossible, renew life whose death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. These thoughts supported my spirits, while I pursued my undertaking with, them, with unremitting ardor. My cheeks had grown pale with study, and my place had been, so, my person had been emaciated with confinement. Sometimes. On the very brink of certainty, I failed, yet still I clung to hope which which the very the next day or the next hour might realize. One secret which I alone possessed was the hope to which I had dedicated myself, and the moon gazed off my midnight labors, while, with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness, I pursued nature to her hiding places. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil? as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave, or tortured the living animals to animate the lifeless clay. My limbs now trembled, and my eyes now swim with the remembrance. But then a resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seemed to have lost all soul or sen sensation but for this one pursuit. It was indeed but a passing trance, one which made me feel with renewed ex acuteness so soon as the unnatural stimulus ceasing to operate. I returned to my old habits. I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the timorous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and had separated from all other the other opponents from a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop a filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting, s starting from their sockets and attending the details of my employment. The dissecting room and slaughterhouse that furnished many of my materials, as and often did my human nature turn with, from, with loathing from my occupation, whilst still urged on with an, by an eagerness which perpetually increased. I brought my work near to a conclusion. The summer months passed while I was thus engaged, heart and soul in one pursuit. It was a most beautiful season, 
Never did the fields bestow a more plentiful harvest, or the vines yield a more luxuriant vintage, but my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature, and the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were so many miles absent, and whom I had not seen for so long a time. I knew my silence disquieted them, and I well remember the words of my father. I know that a while you are pleased of yourself, and you will think of us with affection, and we shall hear regularly with you. You must pardon me if I regard any interruption in your correspondence as a proof that your other duties are equally neglected. I knew well, therefore, that would be my father's feelings, but he could not tear my thoughts from my employment, loathsome in itself, but which, but which had taken an irresistible hold of my imagination. I wished, as it were, to procrastinate all that related related to my feelings of affection until the great object, which swallowed up every habit of my nature, should be completed. I then thought that my father would be unjust if he ascribed my neglect to vice, or faultiness in my, on my part, but I am now convinced that he was justified in conceiving that I should not have been altogether free from blame. A human being in perfection ought to always preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never allow a passion or transitory desire to disturb his tranquillity. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tenacity tendency to weaken your affections, and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful. That is to say, not befitting the human mind. If this rule was always observed, if no man was allowed any pursuit, whether, whether so to interfere with the tranquility of his domestic affections, Greece had not been enslaved, Caesar would have been spared his country, America would have been discovered more gradually, and the empires of Mexico and Peru may have not been discovered. But I forget that I am moralizing in this most interesting part of my tale, and your looks remind me to proceed. My father made no reproach in his letters, and took only notice of my silence by inquiring as to my occupations more particularly than than before. Winter, spring, and summer passed away during my labors, but I did not watch the blossoms or expanding leaves, sights which before had always yielded me supreme delight. So dearly was I engrossed in my occupation. The leaves of the year had withered before my work drew to a close, and now every day showed me how plainly, showed me more plainly how well I had succeeded. But my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety and I appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines, or any other unwholesome trade, than an artist occupied by his favorite employment. Every night I was oppressed by a slow fever, and became nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me, and I, was sh I shunned my fellow creatures, as if I had been guilty of a crime. Sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived that I had become, the energy of my purpose alone sustained me. My labors would soon end, and I believed that exercise and amusement would then drive them away. Uh, dra then would drive away in this disease, and I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete.